Hi there, and welcome to The Artist Craft. I'm your host, Stacey Cochran, and we have an outstanding guest with us in studio today. In Catherine Hale writes and teaches on the relations between culture, science, and technology. Her books include Electronic Literature, New Horizons for the Literary, How We Became Post-Human, Virtual Bodies in Cybernetics, Literature and Informatics, Chaos Bound, Orderly Disorder in Contemporary Literature and Science, as well as several others. She is recipient of numerous prizes and awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, Fellowships and Grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, a Presidential Fellowship from the University of California, and the Luckman Distinguished Teaching Award. She is currently a professor in the program in literature at Duke University. Thank you very much for being on the show today. My pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. Well, I'm honored to have you. Uh, the first question that I have here is from your most recent book, Electronic Literature. Uh, you write in Electronic Literature that it's really crucial that today's literary critic think digital. Uh, what exactly do you mean by think digital? What does all that mean? Well, literary scholars are steeped in the print tradition. Uh, most of us grew up with print. Print is what we're familiar with. But as we vault into the 21st century, not only has uh, traditional literature now increasingly gone digital as print texts are digitized and put up on the web in digital form, but there's a growing body of 21st century electronic literature which differs significantly from print. So thinking digital means taking into account the difference between the print page and the uh, coded electronic screen. So what kinds of things could a young literary critic kind of be on the lookout for uh, with regard to uh, electronic literature? Well, electronic literature is a very diverse category, very um, encompassing many different genres. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so it would really depend on the tastes of the person. But for example, there's uh, hypertext fiction as one important category, mm -hmm. flash poetry as uh, another important category. There are many websites where uh, people are constructing both biographies and autobiographies, so that's another very vibrant category. One of the concerns raised in the book regarding electronic literature is that because of the fluid nature of the media itself that there's really uh, a difficult time in, in preserving electronic literature, that, that the media itself that contains electronic literature uh, will be changing in 10 years or 15 years. Yes, that's a major problem. Um, and in this respect, print is very robust and very durable. So you can open a book from 400 years ago and it still works. But with electronic literature, that's another, uh, another whole uh, can of worms. And so there are many people now working on this uh, issue of the preservation and archiving of electronic documents generally, but specifically electronic literature. So recently, the Library of Congress contacted the Electronic Literature Organization because they want uh, the help of the organization mm -hmm. in identifying 300 uh, works that they will then preserve and archive. How was the Electronic Literature Organization founded? What was its initial purpose? Well, it was uh, founded by a um, uh, philanthropist, Jeff Ballou and Scott Retberg, who is both a print and an electronic writer. And the purpose is to foster the development and dissemination of electronic literature. Very good. I'm interested in your thoughts on how Web 2.0 has changed the roles of producer and consumer. Uh, you know, examples being YouTube, where uh, the producers of the content are really uh, the patrons to the site. Uh, what are your thoughts on how this, this role has been really reversed in the past 10 years or so? Well, I think in many areas we've seen the uh, breaking down of the gates that used to control uh, production. And YouTube is one example, but we might mention Facebook and many other sites, Twitter and so forth. And it's really opened um, the idea of production to a massive, massive global audience. It's fascinating, too, I think, uh, the implications of that. It seems like today's producer, uh, the real producers, are people who are giving platforms to others 
to do the kinds of productions that um, traditional producers 10 or 15 years ago were doing. Um, that's true. The people who are developing the software that makes it possible for ordinary folks to put something up on YouTube or uh, so forth. Um, that's a very important development. And then of course, I guess one question that you're probably asked a lot is, well, how do I find the good literature from, from all this uh, mediocre literature that's out there now? Well, that's a problem with print as well, of course, and we have some well-established uh, mechanisms to identify the good, good literature. New York Times bestseller list or uh, the Norton Anthology, for example. But um, prior to a couple of years ago, no such mechanism existed in the same way for electronic literature. So I and three of my colleagues um, put together the first anthology of electronic literature uh, containing 60 new and recent works. And uh, it's up on the web at the Electronic Literature Organization site. We also published it independently as a CD. And we hope that this will allow um, electronic literature to move more easily into the classroom. What kinds of things are writers doing with electronic literature uh, that are different than what folks watching our show might think of as, as traditional literature? Well, electronic literature has more functionalities at its disposal, as does anything that appears in digital form. So, for example, in addition to words, which remain important for most literary works, you could have uh, animation, you could have kinetic effects, you could have uh, something like a flash uh, implementation, you could have sound files, you could have graphics. So the range of multimodal uh, capabilities is much, much broader with digital literature, and it means that the focus shifts from words alone to this much broader spectrum of possibilities. In your book, How We Became Post-Human, one of the central concerns seems to be that humanity is, is moving towards or hurtling down the wrong path, a path that takes us away from the physical, and that humanity is moving towards uh, what I characterize as this sort of cybernetic evolutionary malaise. Uh, is that a fair characterization, would you say? And do you still feel that same way? Well, I wouldn't say that it's humanity that's hurtling down this path. I'd say it's a few uh, people who envision the future of humanity as post-biological. But it so happens these are very influential players. So people like Hans Moravec, who's a roboticist at Carnegie Mellon, and Ray Kurzweil uh, publish widely, they're widely read, and they envision the human body as a kind of encumbrance that uh, biology has saddled us with, but that we're moving to the point where we'll be able to upload ourselves into a computer and live post-biologically. Well, you even use phrases like that, our consciousness could be downloaded. What do you mean by that? What, what is that? What, what do you visualize when you... Visualize well, for someone that? like Moravec, the argument goes like this, that consciousness is basically a pattern of information. And there's nothing intrinsic about our biological substrate that uh, demands consciousness run on that platform. It can run on other platforms and be the same thing. To me, this is um, a very mistaken idea and shows a gross underestimation of the importance of embodied interactions with thought. Uh, if we could upload our consciousness to a computer, uh, a possibility about which I'm very skeptical, we certainly would not have the same kind of consciousness as we have in embodied form. It's fascinating. As I was putting together this interview, I was thinking, well, is putting a video of yourself up on YouTube, in essence, a kind of uh, you know, moving your body and consciousness into this sort of fixed virtual realm where you're not physically interacting with people, but people see you, they interact with you. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, virtuality in all of its aspects, from virtual reality to mixed reality to using an avatar in Second Life and so forth, without doubt has changed the 
experience of embodiment for many people. And I think many folks experience a real uh, feeling of identification with their avatars. So a lot of people have written about um, how this changes uh, the human condition, so to speak. And it certainly uh, complicates and extends our sense of embodied presence. Nevertheless, embodied presence remains, I would say, a primary aspect of human life in general. What do you think about Wikipedia in, in the sense that it is a place where people are going for knowledge now, and yet it's comprised of many, many people who are uploading stuff uh, seemingly anonymously. Uh, what, is, what are your thoughts on, on that dissemination of knowledge? I have colleagues who forbid their students to cite Wikipedia as a source uh, on the grounds that it hasn't been vetted by the traditional authorities. I even have colleagues who forbid their students to read Wikipedia as though we had the force to do that in any event. Um, but my own feeling is this, that when one consults any source, whether it's print uh, or Wikipedia, um, if you're a good researcher, you don't remain content with a single source. You double check that source against other sources. And if there are discrepancies, then there are various measures of reliability and so forth. So I'm not alarmed by Wikipedia. In fact, I think Wikipedia is the best source for some um, aspects of popular culture, rock bands, for example, or a particular TV show. Mm -hmm. And it really uh, is a framework that draws on all the expert knowledge that's out there that doesn't exist in the uh, authorized channels. To me, that's a great thing. What do you think of what it's kind of done to the traditional idea of, of author? I mean, essentially we have an article that seems like it's written by one person. If you read the text, you can't really see where somebody else entered something or what have you, or you have to dig a little bit to see who's done that. Uh, what do you think of, of that sort of, the, the idea of the author being, uh, you know, many, many people? Well, I think that's a good thing. It used to be that uh, one would be an author in the sense of producing a print book. That print book would be vetted by expert readers at the press, uh, that the press contacts and so forth. But in uh, Wikipedia, there's a very vibrant back and forth between uh, all, all manner of readers and contributors. And uh, incidentally, the whole process of contribution to Wikipedia is a very complex process of negotiation as the edits and changes will reveal if you consult that part of Wikipedia. And if uh, someone who is a member of the Wikipedia community and contributes something that is questioned uh, by other contributors, the usual response to that is to say, uh, what are your citations? And those citations are usually the print world. And so rather than being off completely separate from print, mm -hmm. in fact, Wikipedia has very complex cross connections with print authority. Have you ever posted something on Wikipedia? Have you ever posted an entry? I have not, uh, but a couple of graduate students did contact me and want to put up an entry on me, and they did do me the courtesy of sending it to me, so I made a few corrections. Very good. Similarly, what are your thoughts on the current state of publishing? Uh, particularly being a young writer, uh, I've witnessed the transformation from traditional publishing where, like you say, a book is vetted by a very select few uh, and the number of people being published is relatively limited uh, in contrast to the, the number of people wanting to write books to now today practically anybody with an internet connection and some technical knowledge uh, can publish their book. Uh, what are your thoughts on this globalization of publishing? Well, I think, again, it's a good thing. Um, it has to be seen in the context of what's been happening to commercial publishers. As they've been bought up by large corporations, the demand for a higher profit margin has been relentless. And as a consequence, there's a whole range of good literature in the mid-range, selling, say, from 30 to 50,000 copies or 30 to 100,000, that now can't get published because it won't sell enough. Hmm. And um, 
self-publishing and also publishing on the web is, I think, one answer to that kind of problem of increasing capitalization of independent publishers. But of course it leads then to the fact that, uh, as you said before, how do you find the good stuff amongst mm -hmm. all of this material? And there is a stigma of self-publication that uh, I think is still there, mm -hmm. and maybe uh, at least it has some partial reasons for being there. Do you think books are becoming obsolete? No way. No. No way are books becoming obsolete. Uh, book technology is a highly developed technology and it's simple, it's robust, it's very easy to operate, uh, it endures for a long, long time, and it's highly portable. So it took centuries to develop that, and I don't think it, books are going away anytime soon. Do you own a Kindle, one of these Amazon Kindles? I decided to wait a little bit. I yeah. see that the second version of the Kindle is now out and uh, a little bit improved from the first version. I may even but wait. But you may. You may get one now. Oh, undoubtedly. But I, maybe I'll even <laughs> wait for the third version. I'm interested in how the role of the literary critic has changed uh, throughout your career. What, what kinds of changes have you seen, if any, in the role of the literary critic uh, since you first published your first book in 1984? Well, um, I should say that before I became a literary critic, I had another career as a scientist, as a chemist. And so I came to literature a little later and with a, a different kind of cultural set than I might have had mm -hmm. had I started as a, in literature. And um, so what I've seen over the years is the broadening of the scope of what we would call literary studies, far beyond the uh, monograph that interrogates a single work or maybe the canon of a single author into a whole variety of very robust areas like uh, post-colonial studies, uh, like uh, studies of globalization. Um, so all of those opening up of the kind of uh, areas that one might say falls in the province of literary studies has been terrific, I think. Hmm. What constitutes a literary text in 2009? Well, this is one of the questions I take up in uh, electronic literature, and I do that because many of these works of electronic literature uh, may not contain words. And so it raises the question, does a literary work have to have words? And we do have many examples of things we would put into the camp of literature that don't have words, like sound poetry, that play off the structure of language, for example. Um, but with electronic literature, that area has now been vastly increased. So I suggest we need another term, not literature, but the literary, which uh, would include both works that contain words and also works that don't have words, but draw on the context, the traditions, and the um, the strategies of literature to perform their aesthetic uh, interventions. Hmm. Now you mentioned a moment ago that you did begin in in the sciences, particularly you, you received an MS in chemistry uh, and you worked for Xerox uh, and as a chemical research consultant at the Beckman Instrument Company. Uh, why did you decide to pursue literature? Why did you make that change? I'm sure you've talked about this before, but I'm, I, I haven't read it. Well, why, why did you make that change early on? Well, um, my two loves were always science and literature, and when I began my undergraduate work, it was almost a toss-up, except that literature seemed so uh, romantic and unpractical mm -hmm. that I uh, decided to come down on the side of science. But as I advanced in my uh, scientific education, there was a noticeable narrowing of the questions one could ask. And this is, um, this is an important part of scientific research. It focuses on some small uh, tractable problem that uh, one can address and solve. Um, but my own yearning was t to ask bigger questions. And uh, when I realized that was the case, then I switched to literature. And 
actually that's related to what I said earlier about the broadening of literary studies. One thing that excites me about that is uh, the ability to ask a very wide range of questions. So you're a philosopher at heart. <laughs> well, I, I've been accused of doing covert philosophy, philosophy by other means. <laughs> what kinds of things did you do at Xerox and at, at Beckman? Well, at, um, at Xerox I was working on the toner that's used in Xerox machines mm -hmm. and was part of a chemical team there that was trying to develop better uh, toners. At Beckman Instrument Company I was working on a very uh, specific uh, fairly narrow problem having to do with ion-specific electrodes. Interesting. Now, you were born in St. Louis, Missouri, right? Yes. Did you grow up there? No, I grew up in a rural area in northeastern Missouri. What kind of student were you in, in junior high and high school? I was an obstreperous student. <laughs> I was the kind of student who made trouble. You were a troublemaker. Uh, yeah, not in the sense that I was on drugs or hijacking somehow cars. Somehow I find that hard to believe. <laughs> what kinds of things would you do that would be troublemaking? Well, I, uh, I was going to a rural school and the kinds of teachers that uh, the school could attract mm -hmm. were not first-rate teachers. They were challenging you. Sometimes they weren't challenging. I re vividly remember one class in physical chemistry where we had a very boring textbook and I was covertly reading a uh, much more interesting book on physical chemistry tucked inside my, my big book. And the teacher noticed that I was doing something peculiar, came over and demanded to see the book I was reading. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure she expected it to be some trashy novel. Sure. And when <laughs> That was another better book on physical <laughs> chemistry. She was a little nonplussed. It was that kind of trouble. Fascinating. So how closely uh, or how involved were your parents in your early studies? Was, was there a uh, lot of encouragement? My parents offered a very warm, uh, supportive home environment, mm -hmm. but um, they themselves had never gone past high school. And so uh, probably by the time I got in, in junior high or certainly high school, they were, for example, no longer able to help me with uh, my homework. But uh, they continued to inspire uh, me and provide everything a young person needs. What was driving you then, if, if that wasn't something that was familiar to you? What, what sustained you through an MS in chemistry and later a PhD? In I would English? say a relentless curiosity, mm -hmm. wanting to know how things work. And at first that took the, the form of wanting to know how the natural world works. But uh, it also, uh, when I switched fields, drove me to want to understand how two fields like chemistry and literature so far apart nevertheless showed this remarkable convergence. And that problem, how do you explain the apparent convergence between two diverse fields that aren't talking to one another? has really motivated my research now for some time. They must have been very proud of you. They were. Very cool. Uh, you mentioned the one moment with the teacher and having the textbook. I'm wondering if there's any other moment from your childhood that sort of epitomizes your fascination with science. Well, I, I think there were many such moments, but uh, one thing I remember is although growing up in a small town has many disadvantages, mm -hmm. I was allowed a great deal of freedom to roam around on my own. And it seemed to me as a child that the world was full of riches which didn't cost anything. Tadpoles in a creek, mm -hmm. uh, you know, frogs, uh, buckeyes that you could pick up. And I was fascinated by all those things and had a great deal of freedom to explore them. Fascinating. Uh, Shifting gears back towards the present a little bit, uh, your writing in the past decade seems intensely concerned with the placement of the author within a digital context. Why is this so important to you? Well, there's been a good deal of theorizing about the so-called death of the author, mm -hmm. uh, which preceded most of the work that I've been doing. but. Uh, it seems to me that what we see with digital media is not so much the death of the author as the uh, distribution of the author function in new ways. So for example, if you uh, create a digital work, uh, 
you're collaborating with the software you're using to create that work. And the people who created the software, in a sense, are your remote collaborators. And you're also uh, collaborating with the computer hardware. Mm -hmm. And all of these have constraints in possibilities that you can explore. So uh, very seldom would it be correct to say that someone is in the sense, well, it's probably not even true of print either, but certainly not a single author in the conventional sense. Fascinating. And does it, in a way, uh, does it remove us from the physical? To you know, to be typing up our books, or our stories, or our essays uh, in Microsoft Word, planning to to publish it online. Is there something that is sort of dehumanizing about that? Do you think? Well, some people do feel that digital technologies are dehumanizing for that and other reasons. But uh, I would point out that uh, we should be careful how we use a phrase like the mm. human because the human uh, is, a, is a moving target. And different people and different cultures at different times have had very different ideas about what constitutes the human. For example, most cultures at one time or another uh, in the tribal stage uh, didn't regard the people in the next valley as human. They were human, but not the people over the hill. They were subhuman or they mm. were uh, less than human. So we've had a long struggle of uh, understanding the human to be a capacious category. And now that we're in the digital age, we're interacting with intelligent machines. They're profoundly affecting our present and they will affect our future even more. And I think uh, we need to understand now that the human uh, is uh, to be human is to be engaged in a very complex system of distributed cognition. And therefore, the human is not necessarily the center of everything the way that it was in uh, much earlier eras. We now uh, have all these wonderful machines that we're interacting with and increasingly dependent on. Well, we're down to about our last minute. I'm very interested in your writing process. If you could take us through the typical process of writing and publishing a book, uh, are you able to sell a book on an idea now, or do you have to have a manuscript done and then you find a publisher for it? Talk us through or take us through your, your writing process in our last minute here. I pretty much uh, con make contracts for books uh, on ideas, but I should say that uh, this is not commercial publishing. For the most part, this is academic university publishing. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm probably proudest about is that as I've become a little more well-established, I'm able to negotiate with presses effectively on what the book is going to look like. And so three of my books have won major design awards. And of course, most of that is the work of the designer. But I like to think that I goad the press along to make sure that the design and physical instantiation of the book is going to be as exciting as I hope that the content might be. Excellent. Well, we're just about out of time uh, here on the show today. Uh, for all of us here at the Artist Craft, Michael and Marnie working hard uh, back in the control room, I want to thank you very much for joining us in studio today. My pleasure. And for all of us here at the Raleigh Television Network, thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you. So thank you. You're welcome. So it goes by pretty fast, like I said. Boy, it goes by like a flash. The big part of it is the print.